And what we found is connected teams are the most powerful teams and leaders create a culture of connectedness. And Mudita is a great litmus test. Like when you have Mudita is such a strong part of a culture and being a leader, you know, oftentimes we get what we shine a light on, right? We get what we encourage. So in our teams that we had uh, so much success on, we would, when we saw Mudita, we would recognize it, we would celebrate it. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. I am your host and coach, Tyler Johnson. Thank you for tuning in. And whether you've tuned in to elevate your mindset, your game, or just your day, you're in the right place. My guest this episode is a record-setting high school football coach winning five state championships with an impressive record of 129-9. and nine. He is the co-author of The Twin Thieves, How Great Leaders Build Great Teams. As a speaker and coach, he has worked with the Green Bay Packers, a variety of Power 5 NCAA teams. He is partners in Jaden Jones with Lucas Jaden, who appeared in episode 27 of the podcast. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, Steve Jones. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm great, man. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, excellent. Excited to have you on and, and share a little bit. To, and I guess just to start, just love to kind of hear you what took you on your path to, to lead you to the work that you do now. Yeah. So I think at the dial all the way back to, to growing up. So I was the youngest of five, uh, a little bit of an oops baby uh, by about 10 years. So my mom would call it an unexpected blessing, but I know the truth, right? So, um, yeah, youngest of five, and uh, I grew up with a dad who was who was an alcoholic. He was an abusive alcoholic, and uh, luckily, I had some older brothers who were substantially older than me that kind of stepped up and stepped in as not only big brothers and role models, but father figures to me growing up, and then also just a lot of other like teachers and coaches um, that stepped up in my life and really honestly kind of got to me where I am today. And um, because of those interactions and how meaningful that was to me, that's kind of the path I, I went on right away. I, I became a teacher. Uh, I became a coach uh, because of the people that made a positive impact on me. I wanted to kind of return the favor. Uh, so started off as actually an elementary school teacher. Uh, I had a really uh, impactful elementary school teacher that was a male named Mr. Stoskoff, who is also had hockey coach at our high school and, and really just a, a guy that I looked up to growing up and I wanted to be kind of like him. So I got into elementary school teaching uh, and then ended up um, teaching high school uh, leadership classes. Uh, so for the last 13 years, um, I actually developed three different leadership courses at our high school. Um, so for the last 13 years, my life has really been revolved around leadership and culture and uh, get to listen to a great podcast like this and, uh, and learn and grow and learn a lot from our kids, sure. um, uh, about what makes them excited about leadership, what they're scared of, um, those types of things. And I also was the head football coach at our high school for the last 11 years. And most recently stepped down from teaching and coaching and, uh, joined Lucas Jaden, um, who is an amazing author and speaker and, uh, coach, uh, for some of the highest performers in our country. Uh, and so for last three months, we've kind of officially started Jaden Jones uh, coaching and consulting and um, been working with anywhere from NFL uh, teams to, um, you know, business leaders and college programs around um, leadership development, uh, yeah. cultural growth, and then mindsets, or we like to call it mental skills. We, we say those three, three things are the three-legged stool, <laughs> and you need all three to be successful. So Love That's it. kind of the snapshot version of uh, of my kind of journey that got me here. Yeah, and Lucas is pr one of our more popular podcasts that we've had, uh, for sure. Yeah. And uh, my copy is arriving today, any minute. Um, but talk about a little bit about the book. I'm pumped to read it, but why should other people? I'm going to link it up here, but why should they grab a copy and dive into it as well? Yeah, you know, uh, Lucas and I, you know, uh, wrote this, I guess, a fable uh, about uh, how great leaders build great teams and how uh, great leaders uh, help other people rise above the twin thieves. So that's the name of the book, The Twin Thieves. And the twin thieves are the fear of failure and the fear of judgment. 
we call them twins because sometimes they get mixed up. Uh, a lot of people say they're scared of failure, but the more questions you ask and you get to the root of things, it's not even failing itself. It's the judgment that comes after the failure. So twins kind of get mixed up sometimes. And I think those two, the fear of failure, fear of judgment get mixed up. And we call them thieves because the fear of failure and the fear of judgment uh, can oftentimes rob us uh, as human beings of a lot of different things. So let me, let me throw it back at you, Tyler. What, what could the fear of failure and the fear of judgment potentially rob people of, or maybe have robbed you of in your journey? I think you focus on that. You miss other opportunities. Uh, you miss maybe the quality feedback that others are maybe trying to give because something's putting a barrier in between, you know, you're receiving that um, are, are just a couple of things that pop to mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of things, right? So you kind of hit on it, like, you know, taking advantage of opportunities, uh, getting feedback, taking risks, um, growth, I think joy in the process, relationships, like I could go on and on. I, I think they're the biggest thieves in America right now in our society. So uh, the, I think the interesting thing is they never go away. Uh, as I mentioned, whether it's Major League Baseball or NFL or Division One colleges or uh, really successful CEOs, I think everybody still has the twin thieves in their life. We always look at it as kind of a, a journey in your car, so to speak. Your life's a journey. And some people take the twin thieves and they put them in the driver's seat. And they allow them to, to dictate where they go. So every decision they make, it's, well, am I going to fail? So I'm going to make this decision. Or what are people going to think? So I'm going to make this decision. And some people kind of give them a little bit of control. So they put them in the passenger seat and kind of give them control of the radio, so to speak. But uh, I think the really successful people, even though the Twin Thieves don't go away in their life, they learn how to rise above them. And they, they take Twin Thieves and throw them in the trunk and say, yeah, you can be on our journey. Uh, but you're not having any control over uh, over what I do and, and the risks and the relationships and the joy in this process that I take. I like it. I can't remember who said it, but it's one of those, someone said it to me once too, I think, but it's on that topic of, well, what if it works out even better than you ever could imagine? Yeah. And I think we we quickly rule out that possibility. With There's with, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, like, and I think, like, you know, where your focus goes your energy flows right and a lot of times we're so focused on the failures so there's a story in the book it's actually a true story of um, a family of tightrope walkers and the great grandfather did it for a living for over like 25 years he would walk across a tightrope people would pay money to come see him do it for the first time in his life he had a show coming up he started talking about what if i fall what if i fall there's no nets to catch me underneath what if I fall? Now, the dude's been doing it for over 25 years. It just dawned on him there's no net, right? So guess what happened, Tyler, in that show? He didn't stay on the rope. <laughs> yeah, he fell, unfortunately, to his death. And, you know, for the first time in his life, he was focused on falling. And every other time, he was just focused on putting one foot in front of the other. So where your focus goes, your energy flows. So, you know, another practical example is if I tee up a golf ball, right, and there's water on my right, what's oftentimes getting my focus, yeah. that water, what's going to happen to my golf ball, it's getting wet, right? People that maybe downhill ski. Um, if you focus on the tree in front of you, <laughs> you're going to run into it, right? So going back to your point is a lot of people get focused on the what ifs, what if I fall? What if I fail? What if this doesn't work out? But the other way to look at it is focus on success. What if it works out better than you ever imagined? One thing I wanted to ask you too, uh, you spend a lot of time with student athletes and, and young people and your experience coaching. And um, when you're working with them in developing leadership, I think our society gets a lot of snap judgments of young people, but what are some of the amazing things that you see in some of our young leaders today? Yeah. And I agree. And, and you hear that all the time, like kids these days. Right. Uh, but I also think that's cyclical. Like it, it, you, you ask your maybe your grandparents what they were told when they were little, right? Yeah. That you were younger. Oh, you're lazy. You're entitled. You know, so I think it's like this process everybody goes through that we look back in our lives and we say we were never like that. But I, I, I think kids these days um, are unbelievable in a lot of ways. I think they're more empathetic than ever. I think they're more inclusive oftentimes than ever. And I know I'm making some generalities here and everybody's a little bit different, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of really servant leaders out there. So in our leadership classes, I got to teach three different leadership classes. In one of them, we would do this change project. So kids could identify something in the school or in the community or in our society that they wish they could change. And they work in collaborative groups to try to make that better. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing the passion behind those projects and the in, in, impact that they would make 
in these kind of service projects. And you would hear a lot from our kids about, you know, them going to serve food at a homeless shelter. And I just, I don't remember doing that stuff uh, when I was that age, <laughs> you know, nor did I even think about it, to be honest with you. And I just see so many cool things through the 13 years of working with those young leaders. Really impressive. Yeah. Uh, so I always like to focus. There's a lot of great positives that get drowned out by the, the negatives. So uh, one of the things I've heard you speak about, I wanted you to expand on a little bit, adversity plus resilience equals growth. Can you talk a little bit about that equation and uh, how that plays out in life? Yeah, you know, I, I just think that, you know, ultimately, you know, I know Lucas maybe talked about it in, in his podcast, but we're forged in fire as human beings. So if you look at how, you know, swords used to be made, they would take those blocks of steel, hardest metal on earth, right? And put it in a molten hot fire and they take it out and they pound it and they pound it and they pound it until it cools and they put it back in the fire and they continue that process until they get this beautiful sword, right? This beautiful, strong, flexible sword. And we're the same way as human beings. Like we have to be forged in fire to become who we're meant to be. So when we, you know, experience that adversity, it's an unbelievable opportunity for us to grow if we look through the right lens, the right perspective, right? Perspective drives performance and how you do things is, you know, how you view things oftentimes. So if you view the adversity the right way, it can unlock you. It can buy you a ticket to something that you never thought was possible. And I think, again, it's all about how we approach that, how we respond to that adversity. And if we respond the right way and we look at it through, uh, I guess, a fresh lens, it gives us an opportunity to grow into something that maybe we didn't think was even possible. I don't know about you guys, you, but, or, or the listeners, if you look back in your life, oftentimes we experience the most growth when we were the most uncomfortable or we faced the most adversity. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, it goes back to the twin thieves. A lot of times people want to avoid those things. They want to stay in their bubble, right, Tyler? And, and in turn, they never grow. So if you look at it, like, you know, you go into the weight room, Tyler, um, or you go into the local fitness gym, right? And you go over to the dumbbell rack and you pick up like two and a half pound dumbbells, right? You start doing curls. You're going to look really cool, right? And you're never going to fail. You're never going to make those weird faces you look when you struggle and look like an idiot, but your biceps will never grow. If you go over and pick up the 40 pound, 45, 50 pound dumbbells, whatever they are, and, and all of a sudden you start struggling and you're supposed to try to get eight to 10 and you're at six and you're shaking and you're making all those weird faces and you might fail, your biceps have a better chance to grow in the second scenario. And we're the same way as human beings. Yeah. A lot of times we don't want to face that uncomfortable feeling or that adversity. And therefore we don't grow into the person we're meant to be. Yeah, I like the weight room analogy. I still got a little work to do to get to the 40s, I think. But, <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I like to do on this podcast is look back at the the Twitter and find a tweet. And there is a, a tweet that you uh, shared about that, that caught my attention. I don't know if I'm going to say this word right, but I wanted you to talk about it. Mudita? Mudita? Mudita, yes. Mudita. Can, yeah. you, can you explain that? what that is to our listeners and, and how it relates to being a, a great leader. Yeah. So Mudita is defined as authentic joy for other people's success, right? Authentic joy for other people's success. So within a team, within a culture, within a business, within an organization, it doesn't matter. I believe it's one of the best litmus tests to see if you have a strong team, if you have strong leaders, because if you look at Mudita, authentic joy for other people's success, and you flip that over to the other side, I'll throw it back at you, Tyler. What what do you think might be the opposite of Mudita? When when you have the opposite of Mudita on a team or an organization, what comes to mind? What's one thing that comes to mind? What's the opposite? A jealousy kind of pops up. That yeah. you know, you know, some separation, not not together. Absolutely. So you get jealousy, you get envy, you get drama, you get infighting, you get disconnection, as you said. And what we found is connected teams are the most powerful teams and leaders create a culture of connectedness. And Mudita is a great litmus test. Like when you have Mudita is such a strong part of a culture and being a leader, you know, oftentimes we get what we shine a light on, right? We get what we encourage. So in our teams that we had uh, so much success on, we would, when we saw Mudita, we would recognize it. We would celebrate it, right? So I just remember, I'll give you a football example. Yeah. We had a young man that uh, blew his ACL out. So he was out for the entire year. But on a Friday night on, on during the game, we, we would be filming the game. And you can oftentimes see the sideline. 
And there'll be times on big plays where he's on crutches, right? Only on one leg and he's hopping around on one leg and pumping his crutches up in the air. And he's so excited for his teammates success where maybe some kids would feel really jealous or disappointed that they couldn't be out there. So they would remove themselves, go to the other end of the sideline and kind of just, you know, sulk a little bit, but he was just so authentically happy for his teammates, even though he couldn't be out there. And we would, we would show that on film and we would, we would make a big deal about it and we get more out of it. And I just think it's such a huge part of being a great leader and also fostering a great culture and a great team. Yeah. I love that. I think there's, in our new age, I follow a lot of athletes on their social media. And I think you see a lot of some athletes I observe when their friend wins player of the week, something they're sharing about it, you know, yeah. and, and some guys just share about themselves. Yeah. Um, but it really gets me excited when I see these kids sharing about their other teammates or former teammates success or, or little awards that they're getting recognized for. And that's just one place I usually have my like radar for it because it's the way some of the kids do it. And it's the way they express it beyond, I think their own teams. Yeah. So I was just, I was just down, I was working with, um, UW Madison uh, women's basketball, UW Madison women or uh, men's hockey, and we're talking about this concept and the idea that there's enough success to go around. So, not only I think it's a competitive advantage. If you ever play a team that has Mudita in any sport, right, the bench is into it, yeah. their teammates are in, they're celebrating. Like that's a competitive advantage. That energy is contagious, right? Yeah. And there's enough success to go around. And not only is it competitive advantage on a team. But also, it's just a better way to live. I mean, isn't it a better way to live? Like when you're just joyful and not envious and not jealous, but understanding that you can have your success, you can get your shine too. It's just you enjoy the process so much more. Okay. So not only is it competitive advantage, it's just, I think, a better way to live. What uh, In follow-up, what, what brings you joy in your work that you do? I think it's it goes back to what I, why I opened up and just kind of sharing about my childhood growing up is the fact that so many people made a positive impact on me and never expected anything in return. And when I can do the same for others, um, you know, that, that does honestly bring me joy when I get a message or I get, you know, a DM or if I get an email and after a keynote or I'm working with a team and, and, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm pretty authentically vulnerable. I share about my past and a lot of them will say, you know, I connected to that and, and your message resonated with me. And, it, you know, I had, a, I had a young man came up after a presentation last week and he hugged me and he said, man, you don't understand all the stuff that's going on at home. And he goes, you, you just changed my life. I was like, <laughs> you know, so that stuff um, brings me so much joy. No doubt. Um if uh, you talked about vulnerability there, uh, it's a topic that comes up a lot on this podcast. I think it's crucial to being a good leader, understanding who we are. But can you talk about how as leaders, maybe sometimes <laughs> stepping in to a little bit more vulnerability than we used to can really help them with, you know, coaching and leading young people? Absolutely. And, and I think it's really important. So we use authentic vulnerability for a reason. I mean, it's got to be real. It's got to be for a purpose. So a lot of people, when they hear that word vulnerability, they, they automatically sometimes think about like, oh, it's emotional dumping or, you know, it's it's when, you know, you blast something on Facebook just to get a bunch of attention or, you know, and when we talk about authentic vulnerability, it's purposeful. It's intentional to connect. And when you can show yourself and you can show some of your, your scars, so to speak, or your dings or your dents, it gives something for people to hold on to. So I don't know about you, but if you've ever worked for a leader or played for a leader that tried to come across as being perfect, right? They never made it, admitted a mistake. They, they never showed any of their, their scars or the dents. It's tough to, to connect with them. Yeah. And I feel like it's tough to connect with someone who portrays themselves as perfect because we're not perfect. Right. And it's almost like trying to latch onto this like beautiful porcelain wall, right? You just kind of slip and slide down it until you can, oh, oh, okay, now I can grab onto this. I can grab onto that, right? And I think it builds that connection because one, people won't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And two, people cannot connect with someone that they view as perfect and they never make a mistake because we're not perfect. And when you can give people a little bit to hold on to, intentionally right you you can ultimately connect with them and then you can get the best out of them they can trust you yeah. and that trust is is obviously huge with every anything we do 
For sure. I would say you can only push people as far as they trust you. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so we have, you know, we have a trust framework that we work through and, you know, the top, it, it's kind of like a, a fraction, right? So the numerator on top, it's care. You know, people won't care how much you know until they know what you care. And the fastest way to show somebody you care is to truly listen, mm -hmm. right? Um, credibility, you, you, you got to be credible. You got to be elite in the X's and O's of whatever you're doing, right? And we always talk about, like, if you walked into a bank and um, you gave them a thousand dollar check and that bank teller or the employee there knew your kids' names and knew everything about you and they showed you care, but they took that and they put it in the wrong account, right? That thousand dollars they put it in somebody else's account, you wouldn't trust them anymore, right? Even though they care. So you got to be credible. And then the third component is reliability. Can you show up in people's difficult moments, right? We always talk about it's a person over the player. Are you reliable? Are you consistent? If you do all those three things on top, the denominator on the bottom, the most important part is the authentic vulnerability. And that's being real. And if, if yeah, sometimes if you've ever worked for a leader that maybe they, they, they act like they care just to get a result out of you. And then all of a sudden they're done with that. They don't care anymore. Right. Yeah. Or they're reliable when they feel like it. But when you're real and you're authentic and you're a human being and you see that all the other things, the care, the credibility, reliability becomes magnified. Like the, uh, the bank example there. <laughs> it's a good illustration. Uh, I gave you a magic wand and tomorrow all the young student athletes out there woke up empowered with a, a leadership skill or, or tactic. What would you want the people to wake up with tomorrow? That's a great question. A lot of things pop into my head, right? Um, you know, effective communication pops in my head. I think, you know, the idea, like I said, of listening, I think there's lots of classes out there, obviously around math and social studies and even speaking, mm -hmm. but we don't teach listening enough. Um, and, you know, so communication pops in, but if it's got to just be one, I would say courage mm -hmm. and the courage to be their authentic selves, the, the courage to uh, rise above the twin thieves, because I, I always talk about like, you can have all the leadership skills you want, but if you don't have the courage to step into the arena, if you don't have the courage to use those skills, those skills don't matter. It's like the person that ha has all the skills to play the piano, but they never have the courage to play it in front of everybody. Well, if you don't have the courage to step out and play, right, and play that piano, even though you have all the skills, you know, you'll never be the best pianist, the best piano player in the, you know, that you can possibly be. It's the same thing with leader. I think ultimately it starts with yourself and having the courage to be you and courage to rise above the fear of failure and the fear of judgment so you can step into the arena. Thank you for tuning in and all the way to the end. Appreciate that. If something this episode caught your ear is useful or unique, I would love if you would share it or, you know, a thumbs up is always encouraging as well. If you want to come back and check out more videos, smash that subscribe button, ring that bell for notifications, and we'd love to have you back. Have a great day and go elevate others.